Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. The forced exodus of Christians from Mosul, Iraq, continues as part of the Islamic State purge. Here to update us on the situation are Nina Shea, director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, and Mother Olga Yaqob. Iraqi-born Catholic nun and former Assyrian Christian. And later, my exclusive interview with Broadway legend Elaine Stritch, who passed away last week. It remains the most difficult interview I've ever conducted, and you will see why. Finally, we'll talk about the link between creativity and faith with author of the new book, The Artisan Soul, Erwin McManus. As always, if you'd like to comment on tonight's show, drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com or send me a tweet at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout the show. Now, before we begin, two conflicting federal appeals court rulings were issued this week, both relating to the Affordable Care Act, about whether the government can subsidize insurance premiums for people in the three dozen states with health care exchanges. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond upheld the granting of subsidies, saying the IRS rule was a permissible exercise of the agency's discretion. Just hours before, the D.C. Court of Appeals ruled that the government could not subsidize premiums in states where the federal insurance exchanges have been established. The D.C. Court decision, should it prevail, could cut off financial help to 4.5 million people who were depending on the subsidies in order to afford coverage, which could be a serious blow to the president's health care law. The D.C. Court of Appeals is widely considered to be the second most powerful court in the country. We'll continue to monitor this important story as it goes to the Supreme Court. Now on to tonight's show. The Iraqi city of Mosul was once home to one of the ancient Christian communities in the world. But the Christian presence there has all but vanished since Islamic State militants issued an ultimatum last week demanding that Christians convert, pay the Giza tax, leave the province, or die. And so, for the first time in over a millennium, no mass was celebrated in Mosul this past Sunday. What is to become of the Christian community in Mosul and throughout the rest of Iraq? With the latest, Nina Shea is the director of the Center for Religious Freedom. And joining us via satellite from Boston is Mother Olga Yaqob, a native Iraqi and founder of the Daughters of Mary of Nazareth. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Mother, I want to start with you. Uh, give me a sense of the Christian heritage here. I think for many international viewers, they don't realize how precious and longstanding that this is really the, the cradle of Christianity. Absolutely, Raymond, especially Nineveh and, and Mosul. Um, I am originally from Nineveh. I belong to, uh, by blood and by birth, I belong to the Assyrian people of Nineveh. Um, it, it was always known from the first century of Christianity to be um, a, a region for Christian people. Uh, we have a lot of old churches there, old monasteries, including the monastery that was just taken over by ISIS on Sunday. Uh, that monastery belongs to the fourth century uh, when many, mm. many Christians gave their life to to build these many shrines and holy places for people to worship and pray. So it's such a, a tragedy and a loss for, not only really for Christian community who's losing such a, a very you know, old historic place for, for our tradition and religion, but also for all the Muslim people who experience the goodness and kindness and generosity of Christian people in that region. So it's unfortunate, it's a true tragedy that will impact everyone's life, not only just the Christians that have lost so much since mm -hmm. especially this past weekend in Mosul. Yeah. Nina Shea, we have been talking about this issue, this part of the world so embattled and ripped apart since 
since the early 2000s. What is this? I mean, we're talking about a community here, the Assyrians. They've been there for 6,000 years. For the last 2,000 years, you have this Christian heritage. It is utterly displaced, is it not? This is religious cleansing. This is definitely religious cleansing. These Christians, to a person, were driven out uh, with very little time. Basically, this unfolded um, in Mosul uh, since June 9th. And um, last weekend, of course, was the end of them. There is not a single uh, Christian left in Mosul. And they took everything they had. They took their homes, their businesses, their cars as they were driving out. They took wedding rings, sometimes with their ring finger attached. Oh, my gosh. So they are left with nothing. They're destitute. They're homeless. And these are skilled people, professional people. Mm -hmm. they, their talents could be used. Um, if they were to get a, a, a leg up somewhere. But it's, it's, a, it's more than a tragedy. It's a crime against humanity what's happened. Well, just to give people a sense, 500,000 refugees have vacated this part of Iraq since June 10th. I mean, this is staggering. Mother Olga, you've been in touch with uh, friends, family in the region. Uh, give me a sense of what you're hearing from them. I'm sure they're, they're on the run as well. Yeah, absolutely. On a daily basis, really, Raymond, I speak to, you know, um, laity people and families and neighbors, but also a lot of bishops. Um, like today, I spoke to one of the bishops for three times um, throughout the day. And they, all the bishops of Mosul were meeting with uh, Patriarch uh, Luis Sacco in Erbil to uh, come up with some of the really strategic plan, because if this is not going to be fixed, as you all are well aware, like these people lost absolutely everything, like things that they worked for generations and generations, each family to build homes and businesses and everything is absolutely taken away from them. Um, so one of the things they were asking the, the government and particularly the government in the Kurdistan area to make sure that they would continue to offer resources and welcome the refugees because literally that's the only safe haven for them now, um, you know, whether in Erbil or Duhok and some of them are already in Kirkuk. Um, but as you know, it's not safe there either. Um, so they, they are trying to think ahead, like what if this is not going to be, you know, change? How we can provide permanent places for them? Um, mm -hmm. As maybe some people know that these are the hottest months in Iraq, like literally 120 um, degrees, you know, temperature and, you know, without proper shelter, without enough food every day, enough water. I assure you, I've been on those roads in 1991 during the first desert war. We were displaced. We were in the desert. A lot of children and elderly didn't survive and it will be the same. if enough humanitarian aid will not get to that region. And if people won't speak up, really, this is, as many people are saying, including the patriarch, this is a crime against humanity. It's not about just Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Olga, I'm just going to hold you there for one second. Nina, what is the end game here? What does this ISIS seek to achieve by moving town by town and taking this territory? They already command an area larger than London. Yes, they want to establish a caliphate, an Islamic state. That's what they're calling it now. They want to rule as a theocracy, and they want to have control over the Muslim world, and, they're, and, and also parts that were even part of the Christian world, such mm -hmm. as Mosul, really. Uh, they're eradicating every trace of Christianity um, and biblical history. They, there is, uh, the churches are all shuttered. They've, they've taken down the crosses. They've burned some of them. They've taken a sledgehammer to the ancient sarcophagus of the prophet Jonah, which was, it, it has been lying there for thousands of years in Mosul, in Nineveh. And that's on YouTube. You can see that on YouTube. It's, it's actually, actually shocking, this uh, radical extremist transformation of the society. And other um, non-Muslim groups, smaller groups like the Yazidis have been, Mandeans, uh, the followers of John the Baptist have been affected as well. I mean, Yazidi man told me that uh, several, 13 of their people had their eyes plucked out because they refused to convert to Islam. Wow. Uh, moderate Muslims, uh, tolerant Muslims who speak out, one was killed. He's a professor of the University of Mosul, in the University of Mosul. And he spoke up and said, the Quran does not say that you should do this to the Christians. You shouldn't drive mm -hmm. them out. This is against, this is un-Islamic. He was killed on the spot. Wow. 
it's shocking. Ban Ki-moon, the UN General Secretary, has said this just this past weekend. Any systematic attack on the civilian population or segments of the civilian population because of their ethnic background, religious belief, or faith may constitute a crime against humanity for which those responsible must be held accountable. Representative Frank Wolf heard this, uh, and he took to the congressional well. Here's what he had to say. I believe that what is happening to the Christian community in Iraq is genocide. I also believe it is, quote, a crime against humanity. Last Thursday, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, more commonly referred to ISIS, gave the few remaining Christians of Mosul until Saturday to leave or be killed. ISIS is systematically targeting Christians and other religious minorities in Iraq for extinction. Mother Olga, why is the UN unable or unwilling to call this what it is in Iraq? Yeah, unfortunately, and that's the struggle of, of all of us who are watching this is ha this happening, and especially even, you know, our Christian leaders in Iraq, you know, they are begging for a voice on their behalf to really speak the truth and name it for what it is. Because otherwise, if really those of us who are here, we don't try to be a voice for those, you know, people who are suffering, who are, you know, been persecuted, like literally this is will be even more devastating as i said like nobody would survive if nobody would name it for what it is because it is persecution it is a crime it is it's just unfathomable like we never seen such thing i was born and raised in iraq you know I, I've been in this country only 13 years, mm -hmm. and we've seen a lot of wars, a lot of difficult situations, but nothing like this, absolutely nothing like this. Mm -hmm. Nina Shea, w what is the opposition here to calling this a genocide? Why the reluctance from Ban Ki-moon? Well, I think it's a failure of leadership. We need to uh, put pressure. Uh, Congress needs to work with the president here to get the UN to declare this uh, a genocide, crime against humanity. Um, Mother Olga's right. There's not a moment to lose. People are going to start to perish mm -hmm. because they have nothing, no food, no water, and uh, heat's 120 degrees. Um, they need immediate humanitarian aid. They need um, resettlement they need aid. I mean, the problem is they're, they're not even protected. Is the Nineveh Plain still a safe haven? Can it be a safe haven for them? Well, uh, n without protection, nothing is a safe haven. So mm -hmm. they are, um, some of them are going to places in, further out in Nineveh, but unless the Peshmerga, which is the uh, Kurdish military, protects them, they have no protection. And this is an open plain. Uh, it was uh, historically a battlefield, mm -hmm. and the ISIS just walked into Mosul. They will certainly um, take the villages of uh, you know, this is a, a very fertile plain. Uh, it's the size of Lebanon. It's a great prize for them. So um, it's imperative that we think ahead about where these people are going to settle, talk to the religious leaders who are meeting now. But um, I think that ultimately we m need to make sure that whatever aid is given actually re reaches these Christian populations, because mm. that has also been a, a problem in the Middle East when right. aid has been earmarked for them and has been diverted by the majority groups. So mm. wherever they end up, we have to make sure that they actually get it. Some of the bishops were talking about micro lending or business business loans for them to start up again after this immediate emergency is, yeah. is over. If they survive this, this if they survive immediate this, time yeah. period. Mother Olga, as you talk to people in Iraq, uh, in Mosul, in Kirkuk, uh, do they blame the United States for the predicament they find themselves in? Yes, they do. They do, Raymond. Unfortunately, because this none of this existed before the 2003 invasion, mm -hmm. and and that has to do a lot, really, with what happened. Not only, as Patriarch was saying today, not only um, you know that war. Yes, you know we claim here that we we took Saddam out of the country, and he wasn't a good president for his people. But really, the reality, they didn't take Saddam out. The Patriarch was saying they took the whole country. It, Iraq is no 
longer Iraq that we all knew and we grew up in that country. Mm. So yes, t the truth is they do they do blame you know the the invasion of 2003 mm. and the way that whole war was handled and then pulling the troops out. The whole situation that of of the last few years. Yes, unfortunately, and with all my respect to our um, American men and women in service who gave their life you know to to serve our people here in America. They they offered sacrifices as well, but unfortunately, that whole uh, you know foreign policy and the situation about war was was planned so poorly, and and oh. it really devastated that whole region. No, it's a tragedy, and people can go back and check the tape. Nina Shea, you were here. Yes. Many, I mean, yes. B before the invasion, after the invasion, yes. we were questioning this and what it would right. do to this minority population, and it is such an important Christian community. It is a loss of global heritage it is. that I don't think people fully appreciate many Christians have no idea they're totally clueless that's right and uh, it's mentioned more times in the Bible Iraq is the places in it sites in Iraq than any country except for Israel than sites in Israel so mm. um, it is yes it's a very long history it's a very long history of Christians and Muslims living together mm. that is gone it's going to uh, be a loss for the whole world really I want people to hear what the patriarch of, of Baghdad uh, Louis Raphael Sacco is saying and he, in his statement, he's saying the heinous crime of ISIS was carried out not just against Christians, but against humanity. How in the 21st century should people be forced from their houses just because they are Christian or Shiite or Sunni or Yazidi? Christian families have been expelled from their houses and their valuables were stolen and their houses and property expropriated in the name of ISIS. This has never happened in Christian or Islamic history. Even Genghis Khan or Helagu couldn't do this. Your reaction, Mother Olga. You, by the way, we should say, volunteered at 16 years old. You were picking up the war dead and, and preparing their bodies for burial. So you have firsthand experience with the carnage of this war. Absolutely, Raymond, and that's why I'm, you know, I'm trying in so many ways to speak about finding a solution for, for this situation because I've seen it. I've been on those roads. I've been in the desert. I have, you know, watched people dying and not surviving, and this is even like hundred percent even more than what we have ever seen in the last 40 decades of, of all the wars that happened in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I remember, Raymond, if I might say, even just on a simple human basic, um, I remember when I started talking about peace uh, just before the invasion in 2003, people were saying if the Saddam wasn't a good person, why Iraqi people didn't do something to change the reality in their country? And mm -hmm. I said, what do you expect from a nation in the last four decades? They have seen four wars over 10 years of embargo without any you know support if if 50 percent of population don't read and write they don't have proper food proper shelter if people are physically weak mentally and emotionally and psychologically and there's so much pressure what do you expect from these people how they gonna rebuild their country and defend themselves mm -hmm. so what I'm really hoping that the whole world would hear and stand beside the Iraqi people those who are suffering because of this this crime that's happening in our day and in front of our eyes like really not only these people won't survive physically but even those who would survive if we don't have proper you know shelter to 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 feed them to help them to go back to schools can you imagine how many thousands of children have been out of schools those who didn't finish the school year those who might never go back to school again and then we expect from Iraqi people to build their country I just feel these are just basic needs, you know, like mm -hmm. food, education, to give just basic needs mm -hmm. to these people, help them to realize that they have dignity just like everyone else. How much we care about animals in, in this country, which is something beautiful people do. And we have people are starving and without anyone to even speak on their behalf and be a voice for them. Nina Shea, what is the answer here? What should the American policy be? What should the international community be doing? Well, I think that there is short-term and medium-term mm -hmm. uh, solutions for this. Uh, the short-term is aid, 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 and, you know, Catholic Relief Agency, the Catholic Near East Bureau, the Aid to the Church. And these are kinds of aid, aid agencies that are in there trying to help them. They're overwhelmed, of course. They need help. 
There's also the longer term ones that Mother Olga was just uh, touching on, education. We have to work with, through our di diplomacy and our our AID and aid uh, assistance to foreign countries to work for more tolerant cultures in the world because that's really what the problem is, is this uh, extreme intolerance to uh, diversity, to pluralism of, of different people who think differently. So um, this is going to be a very important long-term task. It's also trying to work with our strategic ally, I've said this many times on your show, Raymond, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and to try to get them to dial down uh, their support for these uh, fanatical Sunni groups yeah. that are marauding both Syria and Iraq at this point. Well, this is the madness of American policy. We are, we are opposing ISIS in Iraq, yes. in Iran, yes. but we're supporting them in Syria, Nina. Yes. We're giving them armaments and I imagine monies as well. <laughs> well this, we, none of this makes sense. Right. We call them rebels in Syria yeah. and then we call them terrorists <laughs> yeah. in, across the border. Right. But it's the same group mm -hmm. same taking group. the same territory mm -hmm. and they don't want these borders. In fact, they're declaring them null and void. This is all one big Islamic caliphate in their minds. And they are doing in, in Mosul today what they did in Raqqa about six months ago in northern Syria. And they've uh, assassinated Christians who remained. They imposed dhimmi contracts where they uh, made the Christians subordinate or get out or, or die kind of situation. We will continue to stay on top of this story. Nina Shea, thank you for doing it. Mother Olga, thank you for all of your work. You can follow Nina Shea at the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute by visiting Hudson.org. And to find out more about Mother Olga's work and the Daughters of Mary of Nazareth, visit their website, dmnazareth, all one word, dot org. When we return, I believe it was the most difficult interview I've ever conducted. You're about to find out why. My conversation with legendary stage star Elaine Stritch when the World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. She became a Broadway legend. Starting in 1944, Elaine Stritch made a name for herself playing brassy, outspoken, hilariously funny characters. And though she appeared in film and television shows over the years, winning an Emmy for her work on 30 Rock, Elaine Stritch was a live performer. A couple of years ago, I learned when I caught up with her during one of her farewell shows at the Carlisle Hotel in New York that it was a nun who was instrumental in helping her get to Broadway. She was also related to Cardinal Samuel Stritch of Chicago. When I sat down with Elaine, I also discovered something else. Stritch was a tough character. This interview was such a wild ride, I didn't intend to ever air it. But when Elaine Stritch died last week, I thought maybe there was something worthy here. She was, as you will see, an outspoken dame to the very end, and even at the beginning. Let's turn the mics on, or you won't get anything worthwhile. I've seen you, I have to say, since I was about that big all these years. I just saw you the other night here at the Cafe Carlisle. Did you imagine... Do you, you did you ever here? hear any of the jokes about Betty Davis? I've loved you ever since... Wait a minute. I haven't asked you the question yet. When Betty Davis said, I, when somebody comes up to her and says, I've loved you ever since I've... You should know better than that. You're <laughs> hip enough to know better than that. I, Elaine, I have seen you ever since I was... Boy, are you looking for a... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm guilty as charged. Unbelievable. I mean, you are the proof positive of what all those jokes are based uh, on. Thanks a lot. So, so, I, but, well, thank but, you. Yes, but, uh, right but, back at I you. I deserve it. A lot. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. Here's what I wanted to build to. Yeah. You were absolutely spectacular last night. How do you do this after 86 I don't know. years, Elaine? I don't know. I, I mean, don't know. The, but I've finally gotten to the point where I've taken, I've always been in love with audiences, I, and I think it shows in my work. I really like them, and that's why it's coming over like we're, we're old friends and we're having a party. That, that's what it felt like. Yeah, and so I, uh, so that's what happens, and that's, a, that's mission accomplished as far as I'm concerned. Why do the wrong people try? She strode the boards, entertaining audiences for nearly 60 years. 
From Rogers and Hart to Stephen Sondheim to a widely acclaimed Tony Award winning one woman show, Stritch never stopped. I'm still here. Plush velvet sometimes, sometimes just pretzels and beer. But I'm here. Oh, listen, I don't like what I'm doing 24 hours a day, but I have respect for those people that have gone to such expense and time and effort to come in to see me. Why wouldn't I just love the curtain call where they're going like this? Oh, and they love you. This is, I mean, this is a love-in. This, this audience last night, I mean, was they were terrific, with you every yeah. moment. Yeah. And you were with them and in this Absolutely. material. Absolutely. No, you don't go that far. You don't do that on your own. No. It's a two, love is a two-way street. Hmm. It really is. And you don't get it for nothing. I want to back up and talk about your early life, your career, and then we're going to make our way to, to other interesting things right. and this fantastic show. You grew up in Michigan, and mm -hmm. your faith... I don't know whether I grew up, but I was there at the were... time. <laughs> and your parents sent you to the Convent of the Sacred Heart. This was really... An well, important part of your formation. To go to. My family were, uh, my dad was getting very successful. He was a self made mad mm -hmm. man. He was running BF Goodrich right. and, it, you know, doing business with uh, General Motors and just uh, getting there. He was a very su successful man. So the sacred, the Sacre Coeur. Sacre Coeur. Oh, yes, very elegant. <laughs> was um, where you went, where you sent your young daughter mm -hmm. to school if you were in the um, upper class. But Reverend Mother Rademacher and you had quite Rademacher. a... Rademacher. Rademacher had quite a relationship. Say it like it is. Uh, uh, I know you'll make me, and I want you to. There. Uh, Reverend Mother Rademacher and you had a... Rademacher. Rademacher. That's it. Had a close relationship. Well, I got along with her, yes, and she was my... I liked her. She was a straight shooter. She was the... the she was the head hog yep. at the Sacre Coeur. She was the, the Reverend Mother. And you tell her you want to go to New York and study acting. Yeah, I went to her because I trusted her. And I said, I want to go to New York. I want to be an actress. Where do I start? And she said, uh, probably let me find you a place to, I, to, to, to live in New York. Because that's going to be your biggest problem. Your family are going to say, how can I send my 17-year-old daughter to, Mich to uh, New York? to become an actress uh, and have her protected hmm. and in safe hands. And she found a convent And she you. found, um, it was like a residence. It was like a, um, a finishing school. And you went there, you took a few, oh, I don't know, subjects you... Uh, not worth even mentioning, you know, current events. That always makes me laugh. <laughs> you sent your daughter to finishing school to take a course in current <laughs> events. All you had to do was give her a subscription to the New York Times and you would save you thousands. Pass the course. Yeah, right. And there was a Mother Benziger there, another nun. Mother Benziger was another soccer cur nun. But what, who, you, were, you were very close I love to these, these women. women. I love these women. I love the nuns. They... they well, if they were good human beings. I met a couple I, uh, oh, well. I, we won't talk about. Me too. You, oh, yeah. Oh, I know a few. I mean, <laughs> a, a religious person who's not for real can be dangerous. Now, you go to the, New, the School of Social Research downtown, really the hotbed of acting at the time. So many great well, actors were studying Well, that was such a there. great title. I used to call it the Dramatic Workshop of the New School for Social Research Blues. <laughs> That's what I called it. I mean, I never what? saw such a title to a dramatic school. I loved it. I loved it. And, and Marlon Brando was one of your classmates? Sat next to me in school. You dated him a little bit? Yeah, everybody would think that was just the gift of a lifetime. Not you. Pain in the... <laughs> Is now, what he was. He takes you... That You told in your, in your show, Elaine Stritch at Liberty, you told the great story. He takes you home, he comes out in his pajamas, you get on the train and... Go I'm away. Home. I'm back at the convent with Reverend Mother <laughs> Benziger. And every woman in the world would say, is she out of her mind? No. No. I love it. No. So you, then later he apologizes to you. You told the story. He apologizes to you. He breaks a glass in a bar. You say what to him? You never told that part of the story. What do you mean I say what to him? Well, he, when he broke the glass and said, I'm sorry. I understood I didn't have uh, to like, say what. I knew what he was going through. He really... He he was sorry for upsetting me. He didn't know that he was going to upset me to the 
degree that he did. Mm, to the degree that he did, yeah. yeah. Right. Later, you work with the great Noel Coward, who you were cast in his plays very, when you were, what, 18 years old? You were in one well, of his plays? Well, he came to see me in my first big musical in Philadelphia, because mm -hmm. he'd heard that I was good from... Goldilocks. From, um, oh, the conductor, the great conductor. What's, what's his name? The famous, famous conductor. West Side Story. Uh, Com Bernstein. Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein. Who said that? Chris. What do you do for a living? <laughs> He's my producer. Yeah, well, He's... oh, you're his producer. Oh, good. I'm glad it. it isn't the other way around. <laughs> you're where you belong. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. That's all right. We, we need help. That's why. Yeah. It's my help. Good. So, so Leonard Bernstein tells Coward to come see you in Goldilocks, and he says what? Well, he tells me that he thinks I'm talented and that he wants me to be in a show that he's writing. So that's as simple as that was. So I did Sail Away, and I spent two of the most exciting years of my life with Noel Coward. Mm. And we hit it off. Oh, yeah. We had no problem at all. He, he called you Stritchy. Stritchy, yes. He said in his diary, and I, I dug this up the other day, she's wildly enthusiastic and very funny of you, he wrote. I think I shall be able to manage her, he said. Yeah. Why do you think he said that? Because that's what he thought. Mm -hmm. Nobody was going to not. He 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 was. If anyone was able to man, I didn't know I was that difficult. You never know what you present to others. Oh, the gift that God would give us to see ourselves as others see us. Who was it? Burns, wasn't it? Yep. Okay. So I wasn't aware of it at all that I was a problem, mm -hmm. but I was. I was a complicated talent, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because I didn't believe in myself. And if you don't believe in yourself, you're not presenting the true self. Mm -hmm. It's not coming over. So you're confusing people. Well, you certainly I look believe like, in yourself now. Yeah, well, I, no, I'm not, I'm not even saying that I do now. But people who are unsure of themselves present a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Elaine, I didn't realize at 18, you were the original Trixie in the Honeymooners pilot. Yeah, which was a very unfortunate. I don't even like to talk about it. I... I just think it's terribly interesting what Jackie Gleason said to me. He said, I'm, I, you're not going to play Trixie. We've seen it, and you're too much like me. Oh, so that was it. Yeah, he thought I was a great comedian, and he said, you can't have everybody on the Honeymooners funny. Mm. you got to have one straight man, uh -huh. and that was Trixie. When, when you were in Chicago touring in Call Me Madam, you pay a visit to... Was Cardinal Stritch of Chicago your uncle or your cousin? We called them uncles when they were so many cousins you Removed. couldn't count them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, would, I would lean towards they, was, he was a, 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 a distant cousin of mm -hmm. mine. But we were in the same family and we came from the same part of Ireland. And yeah. I, I think it was county or Cork, I don't yeah. know. But it wasn't a close relationship. Well, you only met him once. Yeah. Only That's met right. him the one time. Yeah. And my father arranged that because the cardinal had seen something in the paper that was fine with him, but he said, when someone is talking about me, I want to meet them. That was the cardinal's invitation. Oh. So I went and met him, and he was a charming, very hard-boiled man. After that experience, in the, in the late 60s, you bartended for a while at Elaine's. Yeah, I got tired of the theater. I got tired of the insincerity of it. I, I, a lot of people were letting me down as friends. A lot of people were letting me down artistically, emotionally. And I got scared and lonely. And I'm sitting in Elaine's restaurant one night, and I was a good friend of Elaine's who owned the restaurant. And um, I said, can I tend bar? I love tending bar. I always had so much fun at home. I would do it at my mother and dad's parties and you know and I was a good bartender I knew how to make you know yeah. a lot of kids were doing brand muffins I'm <laughs> doing whiskey sours <laughs> and and the drinking became a bit of a crutch for you in your professional life as well I don't know about crutch I just love drinking mm -hmm. I love the way it made me feel and so therefore I got too wrapped up in it and mm -hmm. I liked it too much and I overdid it many many times I'll drink to that. And what for Mahler? Stritch finally kicked the drinking habit following a diabetic attack that nearly took her life in 1988. 
But when I tried to get her to explain how she wrestled the alcoholism into submission, she would have none of it. Just no, I don't want to talk drinking. about drinking. Yeah. Drinking was a problem because I liked it too much. But you so overcame I quit it. it. You overcame it. Well, that's all right, but I don't want to talk about that either. Because I, I think that I think it's a fascinating part of your story how you overcame. Well, maybe so. Someday we'll on. do an interview about booze. Okay. I'm not going to do it now. Okay. This is close to the show. Okay. It's too complicated, and it's too in detail. I don't treat anything that happens in my life as ending up just because of my age. God knows what I'll be doing next year. I don't know, and that's what makes my particular career very, very interesting to me. Yeah, I live one day at a time, and I never know what's coming up. I never know whether a straight play's coming up, or a comedy, or a musical comedy, or a club act, or I may go to in the circus. I don't know. How do you want to be remembered <laughs> as a performer, as an individual? As individual. somebody who cares about enough about her career and entertaining an audience so that she can level with her interviewer before the show that she's got to go. That's how I want to be remembered. <laughs> That's how and you'll tell be the remembered. Truth. How about that? Thank you, Dean. All right. It was Love nice you. meeting you. you, nice talking to you, and Great now let you. go of me. You're gone. All right. <laughs> Remarkably, Elaine Stritch is now gone. She died last week of natural causes outside her hometown of Detroit, Michigan. And that, ladies and gentlemen, remains the most difficult interview I have ever conducted. May Elaine Stritch rest in peace, though I'm not sure if her companions ever will. Up next, are you creative? Would you like to be? Even if you don't consider yourself artistic, my next guest may convince you otherwise. Erwin McManus is here to talk about his new book, The Artisan Soul, when the world over continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. St. John Paul II, in his letter to artists, wrote, Not all are called to be artists in the specific sense of the term, yet, as Genesis has it, all men and women are entrusted with the task of crafting their own life. In a certain sense, they are to make of it a work of art, a masterpiece. That idea certainly runs through the work of my next guest. He, too, embraces the notion that we are all caught up in the creative act of God, meant to craft our own masterpiece. Erwin McManus is a Christian leader on creativity and the interaction between faith and art. His latest book, The Artisan Soul, makes the assertion that we're all artists. He joined me recently here in studio to discuss. Take a look. Erwin, you make the suggestion, indeed it's an assertion in this book, that all people are artists. Now, in the book you mention your wife, and I, I bet there are a number of people watching, who say, wait a minute, I, I'm not an artist. I, I, I'm not artsy in the least. You would say what to them? Well, I would say, well, when people tell me I don't have an artistic bone in my body, right. I say, you may not have an artistic bone, but you have an artistic soul. Mm. Because well, when people think they're not artistic or creative, what they mean is I can't paint or I'm not a dancer or I can't play the violin. Right. And when I say that you're an artist, what I mean is that you have all the tools of being an artisan. You imagine, you dream, you see in the invisible, mm -hmm. and then you translate that into reality. Every human being essentially creates. In the same way that bees create hives and ants create colonies, humans create futures. We imagine a world that doesn't exist, a life that we've never lived, a future that we've never known, and then we create it through courage, passion, and through discipline and skill. There's a line in the book, and you write, true creativity is born of risk and refined in failure. Explain that, and why do you think people are so afraid to create to take those risks, to live the life that God's calling them to live? I think some of it is that we've been uh, programmed to imitate rather than to create. Mm. We're, we're raised to color inside of the line rather than to begin to imagine outside of the lines. Mm. Uh, some of the interesting research on children is that before we're 12 years old, most of us are, are really naturally divergent thinkers, about 95% of humans, and only about 5% are, are, are convergent thinkers. But by the time we passed the age of 12, only 5% of people tend to be divergent thinkers. Explain the difference. So the difference is that when you're five years old, 
and they give you one question, you think of a thousand different answers. Mm. When they ask you to solve one puzzle, you think a thousand different ways to solve it. Mm. But by the time you get to around 12, 13, 14 years old, you're only looking for one answer to fill in the blank because that's the way you've been trained, that there's one, there's one thing you can do with the iron. There's one thing you can do with that rock. Mm. But if you're talking to a five-year-old, they'll give you 50 things they can do with the iron. Conformity. I mean, that's really what you're talking about. You mentioned that this is discussed in the book, this notion of having to be like everybody else. Is that one of the things that sort of holds people back, keeps them from the de per personal divine path that perhaps they're called to? Well, remember, we wouldn't conform if we didn't get something out of it. Mm. It's not that we're all driven to uh, conform. We're all driven to long to belong. Huh. We all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. Mm -hmm. And if conforming is the only way we can belong, if conforming is the only way we can feel loved and accepted, then we choose to conform rather than choose to be rejected. I love this idea, though, that your life can be your masterpiece. This is the canvas that's you're right. given. Yeah. And that's kind of the through line of the, of the artist and soul. Absolutely. Uh, some of the core um, phrases for me is, uh, in the book is, you are both a work of art and an artist at work. Mm. And that all of us, if we, can, if we can embrace this part of being human, that we're all works of art, that we're created by God, we're imagined to imagine, created to create, and that we were an idea in the mind of God before we ever had an idea in our own yeah. minds. But at the same time, we're also artists at work. The moment we begin to imagine, the moment we begin to dream and begin to realize those dreams and imagination, then we begin our, journey, our artistic journey. There's a great line. You say, we begin when God exhales and we inhale. <laughs> uh, that really is a nice description of prayer. It is a beautiful description of prayer. And one, one of the lines in, in the book is, um, we breathe, therefore we create. Mm. And, and if you think of that, that first moment when in, in the scriptures, when it says that God breathed into humanity. Right. Hit the breath of God, and that's when we <gasps> inhaled. God exhaled, we inhaled, and life came into wow. us. And I, I love that intimate moment because in, in a beautiful way, mankind began with a kiss. Humanity began with a kiss from God. Mm -hmm. When he breathed his creative force into us, and we inhaled his creative force, and we've been creating ever since. You talk about the narratives that mm -hmm. we tell ourselves, which can be destructive. Yeah, absolutely. If they, aren't, if they aren't true, if they aren't guided to something bigger and outside of ourselves, something divinely inspired. You know, for me, I look back at my life and I realize that I was a classic underachiever. Huh. You know, I was a straight D student, first through 12th grade. I didn't go to college right away. I was just working construction and being, uh, working as a carpenter and, and just finding any kind of odd job I could. And, and really, my life look, looked like it was going nowhere because it was going nowhere. Huh. By the time I was 12 years old, I was in a psychiatric chair. I, was, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in a hospital. I, I was a, a really broken human being. And I look back and I realize that there was a, a narrative inside of my soul that told me I was nothing, that I would never amount to anything, that I was broken, that I was a, a, a defect, and that I would always be alone in the world, that I would never amount to anything. And those voices were so powerful in my soul that even when people tried to encourage me or tell me that there was value in me, that story didn't stick. And so in, in the second chapter of the book, I talk about the, the narrative that guides, that, that all of us, in a sense, have this inner voice. But that inner voice is really the, the culmination of all the voices we've ever allowed into our souls. Mm -hmm. And some of those voices have wounded us, and some of those voices have healed us. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, the transformative moment was when the voice of God became the principal voice in, inside of my soul that said I had value that I mattered, that I was created in the image and likeness of God, that my life had intention and meaning. Mm. And that voice began to silence all those other voices that were telling me that my life would never amount to anything yeah, at all. In the all. book you mentioned, we've been telling ourselves uh, these flawed narratives since Adam and Eve. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to justify the fallenness, the brokenness, all of this. Tell me something that happened to you in 2012. You reference it here. You say there was a betrayal, something went wrong, you <laughs> lost everything, everything you'd sort of worked toward. You were floating high. You felt you had the wealth and the, and the cushion that your life was going to continue like this. And then boom, 2012 happens. You don't say what it is in the book. What was it? Well, Raymond, I mean, thank you so much for bringing up the, one of the well, most painful to, moments of I my life. I want to bring up the happiest <laughs> narratives I can possibly dig up. It's, it's part of my vocation. Right. Well, I, I, I've always worked um, in, in multiple fields. And mm -hmm. for years, I had a fashion company, and I had a film company, and I owned a, uh, a tech company. Mm -hmm. and, and life was going really, really well. And, you know, I, I had uh, formed a partnership. I had to sit down with my wife. What was the lesson? What was the takeaway? When well, it was I sat over? down with Kim, and I said, honey, I need to tell you, I just lost everything. And her response to me without blinking an eye was, 
I thought I was your everything. Oh. And when she said that, I didn't know what I didn't know what to do. When she said that, I I, I was. Wow. I, I was just overwhelmed. I said, "Who says that? You, you you write that in the film, and you think no one says that. <laughs> there is no human talk being this who way. says that." And 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 of course, I didn't know how to be as noble as she just was. So I said, "Well, I lost my other everything, <laughs> <laughs> the other the other half of everything." Yeah. Well, and and you know, and one by one, I, I told my kids, told my friends, and uh, my kids were beautiful, really. You know, oh. my, my son, he said, y "You're Irwin McManus. She'll be fine." <laughs> and Dad, you, you, there is nothing you cannot overcome. Hmm. And my, my daughter said, Dad, you know, you, you have so much responsibility in your life that I think God wants to do something new, and you would have never uh. walked away from that and uh. because you're so responsible. I think uh. God was just wiping the slate clean and letting you start a new part of your wow. journey. Hmm. And Is I, that what he was doing, do you think? It was not easy. I mean, I spent mm -hmm. a year going back and finishing every project they did not finish. Hmm. I took out massive loans just to finish everything so that no one was left unpaid, paying employees that were not paid and finishing projects that were not finished. Hmm. And, and I remember after a year saying to our community, I wanted God to meet me through my faith. Oh. In other words, provide some kind of miraculous intervention. I said, but he didn't. He met me in my faithfulness. Hmm. He just gave me the strength to see everything through hmm. and finish every project and finish this journey with integrity. And turn you in a new direction. Yeah, so I would say, yes, God met me, not in that miraculous faith kind of thing we'd love to see, yeah. but in a moment of faithfulness to teach me that I have the strength to overcome this kind of difficulty. Well, I lo love the line from St. Teresa of Avila, who she's going to build a new foundation. She feels called by God to do it. She gets in the carriage and goes across. There's a flood. She falls out. She's there in the wet. The water's up to her knees, and she says, is, is this how you treat your friends? And he says, yes, it is. She said, no wonder you have so few of them. And that's probably how you felt in that moment. But you know, it was one of the most beautiful times of my life as well. And anyone who's ever created any kind of artistic work mm -hmm. knows that pain and brokenness becomes the best material for creating something beautiful. Mm. Not if you drown in your despair, right. not if you wallow in your own bitterness, but if you find hope in the despair, and if you find life in the midst of that and forgiveness in the bitterness, mm -hmm. then you have the material to create a beautiful life. You say in the book that really one of the keys to create something that's eternal, that's of real lasting value, is to make yourself something eternal and of lasting value, and that's through a spiritual formation. But many people forget that. They cut God out of the creative act. Mm -hmm. This is my thing. This is what I do. This is my business. This is my work, whatever it is, or my, or my book, or my play, or my whatever. Mm -hmm. God is kind of an afterthought. Yeah, you, you know, I, I think, Raymond, coming at this from really multiple places, I am mm -hmm. so convinced that, that the church needs a creative revolution. Mm -hmm. there, this, for me, this is my creative manifesto. Mm -hmm. I think for a couple of reasons. There, there are more people out there who would say, I'm not creative, because they were told all their life they were not. Mm -hmm. And they need to embrace their identity of who they are. They are creative beings. Mm -hmm. But then there are this, this other group that says, well, you know, God's really not for creativity, so I'm going to create without him because I can't get permission, so I'm going to do it almost in rebellion. Mm -hmm. See, I think the reason many people go to create without involving their faith mm -hmm. is because they actually believe that God is not for the creative act. Oh. I was in New Zealand speaking to filmmakers and television uh, producers and directors and, and a lecture on creativity. Yeah. And after about three hours, this really renowned director said, you, you speak so much about creativity, but the Bible leaves no room for creativity. Oh, limitations. He said, it's all limitations. Yeah, how do you reconcile not, that? They said. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I really see what the church desperately needs is a new narrative. We need to see the scriptures from a fresh way. We need to take the Bible back from those who turned it into a, a manuscript of conformity mm -hmm. and reclaim it as a manifesto of creativity. Mm -hmm. And Thomas said, how in the world could you see the Bible as not having any room for creativity? The opening act in the Bible is God creating everything. Yeah. From nothing. <laughs> From nothing. Yeah. The Bible begins as a creative act, and it is a continuous creative act where God invites us into the creative act. And you even suggest in the book, it's true, that the boundaries, yeah. these limitations are actually good for creativity. Explain that, because that would seem to be, the, I mean, this was always the, the rap, uh, Flannery O'Connor, the great novelist, used to always get the, how can you be a Catholic <laughs> and, and be a writer? And she said, I, you know, it, in fact, those walls make, it, make me freer, make me see the world. I, I'm freer with my talent, and I have to be better 
than the competition because of the expectations placed upon it. That's right. The, the whole mythology that creativity requires no boundaries mm -hmm. is just that. It's an illusion and a mythology. Mm. The greatest novels that have ever been written, whether it's War and Peace or Catcher in the Rye, mm. were written with the same number of letters. <laughs> <laughs> and that's by itself, I can detest, limiting. That's right. And yet, what they could do with the same number of letters mm -hmm. is a proof of the wonder of the creative act. Mm -hmm. There are only three primary colors. Every artist has always been limited to those. Mozart, Beethoven, uh, you know, Chopin, they were all limited to 12 notes. See, it, creativity isn't about having no boundaries. Creativity is what we are able to Do within create those within those boundaries. Uh -huh. That's right. I, I want to end on this. You make special mention of the first miracle that Jesus performs here, <laughs> turning the water to wine. Why that mirror? And, and you know, I, I just, I guess I never thought about it. I never stopped doing it. You think, oh, this is the first, and then there are many others. Mm -hmm. But it is an interesting thing to consider why that was the first one. It was so mundane. It was so small, if you will. You see a deeper lesson there. What is it? So when I opened up the Bible and the first miracle is turning water into wine, I'm going, this is sort of underwhelming. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. If I'm Jesus, I'm starting with walking on the water, right. calling Raz, Raz right. out of the dead. Exactly. I, Casting I want, out demons. You want something spectacular. If you're going to end with the resurrection, you should really start with something spectacular. Mm -hmm. and, and he's at a wedding he doesn't want to be at. It's right. not his own wedding. Right. His mother forces him <laughs> to be involved. And in fact, he says, I'm not going to do this. And she just ignores him and says, do what he says. Fill up the water. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. Oh, Jesus has a relationship with his mother like I had with mine. Yeah. And most of us do. Yeah. And, but you listen to her. And that's right. You still do <laughs> what she says. And, and, and I, I thought this is so interesting because when Jesus has him, fill, have, has him filled barrels with water, then he says, now take him to the master ceremony. Mm -hmm. and, and when he tastes the wine, Jesus isn't there. And I love that because there's so many different issues here. One is when he tastes the wine, it's the best wine he's ever tasted. Mm. And he says, where'd you get this wine? People use the best wine first while everyone can still taste the wine uh -huh. and then bring out the really bad wine when everyone is already Shoker. drunk, right? Yeah. And, and, but you've brought the best wine at the end. I thought, why did Jesus make the best wine in the world? What a waste of a miracle. Mm. And then it struck me that all art is an extension of the essence of the artisan. Huh. There is no way God could have ever done anything except for the best. Huh. That wine is an expression of the essence of Jesus, so it has to be the best wine in the world. Because really, all we create is the externalization of what is inside of us. If we're filled with love and hope, optimism, joy, we create that kind of world. If we're filled with hatred and uh, racism and anger and mm -hmm. unforgiveness and bitterness, we create that kind of world. Mm -hmm. But I also love this. Jesus didn't sign the jar, you know, made by God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, he trusted the quality of what he created to draw and drive people to himself. Mm. And, and this is a part of what I'm asking in the artisan soul. Shouldn't our lives be like good wine? Mm. Instead of having the right Jesus all over our T-shirts and putting it on the back of cars and, you know, right. letting people know that this belongs right. to God. Right. Shouldn't our lives be so rich with life and joy and adventure and curiosity and beauty? That the works speak for themselves and the excellence right. and the beauty and the goodness, truth and light that people are seeking. Absolutely. We should lead be the through. best teachers in the world and the best writers in the world and the best engineers and architects and the best humans. So that when people taste of our lives, they go, where? Did this come from? Mm. That's right. the artisan soul. The artisan soul, crafting your life into a work of art by Erwin McManus, is available at bookstores everywhere. It is a fascinating read, particularly those of you in the arts or anyone with a creative streak. Well, that's all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. In the meantime. We'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. We'll see you next time. Bye now.